So, uh, hi everybody. Um, so, it's, it's my pleasure to invite, uh, introduce Sonika uh, Jauri. Uh, she's a senior applications researcher at INQ, uh, which is a startup commercializing trapped iron quantum computers uh, based, I think, in Maryland. Um, she has a PhD in theoretical condensed matter physics from Princeton University. And uh, from 2014 to 2019, uh, she worked as a quantum algorithms researcher in at Intel Corporation. Um, um, from then, she's been, been working, working at uh, INQ. And uh, she's a leading expert in designing algorithms and software for near-term uh, quantum computers, as you could tell from her uh, six plus, or actually seven plus years uh, in this field. Uh, on a personal note, Sonika was actually um, my senior in my undergraduate at IIT Delhi in engineering physics, and we were just uh, uh, joking about uh, whether it was physics or more engineering. Uh, but I think we just decided on it was engineering physics. Um, so I would hand over the floor to Sonika, and uh, um, I guess Sonika, we can have questions during the talk, or do you want it after the talk, or what do you? Um, so I'm really happy to take questions during the talk. So I, I'll stop after every slide or two and just say like any questions. Okay. I, I think that's better to have a dialogue rather okay. than. So uh, excellent. So I would uh, ask everybody to mute themselves and uh, you, they can raise hands and I can moderate uh, and I can ask uh, questions. Uh, so sorry, you can ask questions by unmuting yourself um, once you have the floor. OK, so uh, Sonika, please. OK, thanks uh, Akshay for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. OK, so hello everyone. Um, uh, as actually said, I'm an uh, applications researcher, a uh, quantum applications researcher at IMQ, and I'm going to talk to you about running algorithms on trapped ion quantum computers. Um, so Akshay asked me to begin with, uh, you know, uh, sort of how my journey into quantum computing and uh, also uh, uh, also give you guys an idea of what I do on a day to day basis because you thought that would be interesting. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background about how I ended up in this field. So um, I did my undergrad degree, uh, a, as Akshay mentioned, in engineering physics from IIT Delhi. Um, and uh, after that, uh, I went to Princeton uh, to get a PhD in uh, in condensed matter physics, in theoretical condensed matter physics. Um, so over there, I basically did a lot of simulations of uh, correlate, strong, strongly correlated and disordered um, electronic and spin systems. Um, so my, I finished my PhD in 2014, and after that, you know, I was, uh, I'll admit that I was a little bit like, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of I didn't want to, uh, I didn't see myself going into academia or a postdoc position, so I decided that I would give industry a try. So I got a job. Uh, my first job in industry was actually nothing to do with physics. It was a, uh, it was as a, as a researcher, uh, come a software engineer at Intel, right? So it had, was nothing to do with physics. It was more machine learning and software engineering. But very quickly, when I was at Intel, I realized that I really missed physics. And then, um, as luck would have it. At that same time, Intel had started to get interested in quantum computing and they had just uh, set up a quantum computing research group. So internally, I applied for a job in that group and I got it uh, and I transferred over and uh, thus I began like my career in quantum computing. So I worked for, at Intel uh, for uh, four, uh, for four, no, for five years um, until 2019 and I helped uh, basically I helped uh, their group get up and running and at that time they were doing both superconducting qubits and uh, silicon quantum dot qubits so I was helping them uh, design uh, algorithms for their for their few qubit systems and then um, at some, and while I was at Intel I was collaborating uh, I had a very strong collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Chris Monroe at University of Maryland, uh, who was working on trapped ion quantum computers. And uh, at, at some point, he had also set up this uh, a startup called IonQ, 
um, which was commercial commercializing uh, the trapped iron quantum technology. And he gave me an, uh, 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 after I'd worked with him for a couple of years, he actually reached out to me and said, do I want to come and join his company? And uh, I was kind of bored again of working for a large company for many years, and so I said yes. And so since then, I've jumped into the startup world. Um, uh, it, it's it's exciting, it's fast paced, it's a little bit stressful, uh, but uh, I I really like it. I get to be a physicist. I get to actually apply physics, uh, you know, out in the real world. Um, I do I do research, um, and I also have uh, like a, a lot of impact uh sort of uh, out in the real world so i find it a very very satisfying career and really encourage other people also like if you can kind of find um find um industrial positions in physics i really encourage you to explore that as well um so uh uh akshay asked me to give an idea of what i do uh on a daily basis so broadly my job is to develop quantum solutions using our quantum computers right for our customers uh, such clients, right? So our clients, the clients at IMQ can be anything from big, uh, big corporations, large corporations that are getting interested in quantum computing technology and want to know what it can do with them. Or they can be other like quantum software companies, little startups that want uh, to use our systems to build uh, solutions for their own clients. They can be like uh, national labs or other research uh, agencies that kind of want to benchmark, let's say, quantum technology or quantum computers, and they can be um, they can be in educational institutions. So I've worked with all of those different clients and sort of the common thread is that uh, let's say we have uh, the common thread is developing quantum solutions, right? So I'll give you an overview of how that goes. So let's say uh, we have a client. Let's, for example, let's say um, in finance or let's say in the aerospace industry. And they have a problem that is really hard, that is really in inefficient to solve on uh, classical computers, right? And so they're interested in whether quantum computers can give them a speed up or an edge over conventional computing technology. Um, so what, what they will do is that they will come to us with that problem. And so the first part of my job is uh, I, I look at the problem and um, I sort of, um, I, I abstract out the, the, the mathematical statement of the problem and then corresponding to that, whether it's, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a large system of linear equations or um, some, uh, you know, finding uh, or factoring a number or, um, you know, doing some kind of, uh, you know, finding the dipole moment of some uh, battery material, right? Whatever the problem is. Uh, uh, you abstract out uh, the problem statement, the mathematical problem statement, and then accordingly uh, you formulate a quantum algorithm. And this, of course, requires you to be up to date on all of the all of the quantum computing literature, know all of the latest methods, and so on. And so, once you've formulated the quantum algorithm, uh, we go ahead and uh, I go ahead and implement it. Uh, implementing it means actually uh, coding it. So I. So currently quantum software is in the very, very preliminary stages. So pretty much I have when you go in, when you go in and implement a quantum algorithm, you have to hand tune it, right? So if anyone is old enough to have programmed the old mainframes, they'll know how painstaking that is. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a lot of expertise is really required and a lot of care. Um, um, so once it's implemented, uh, then we test it on our current quantum hardware, right? And so typically um, uh, you would test it for uh, a, a bunch of system sizes, right? Let's say uh, we have uh, 32 qubits. You would uh, test it for say five, uh, the algorithm for five qubits, 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on. And in that, in that way, you can get a sense of how the performance of the algorithm scales, right? Like how the time to solution scales, how the, uh, how the accuracy scales, Etc. Right. Um, and um, after you calculate the scaling performance, you would face off against the best classical algorithm. So basically, um, uh, try to make some prediction about how uh, how this algorithm is going to perform once we have better hardware. 
uh, how it's going to perform against the best quantum, uh, best classical algorithms. And then, uh, and then if you find that it's it's not going to be good enough, you go back and improve the quantum algorithm and s sort of go around in this circle a few times. And in the end, um, and in the end, you come up with uh, uh, you come up with a good solution, and then you can sort of um, uh, you you have uh, you can go tell the client uh, that uh, you know that this is a tentative plan of action they can have if they want to use quantum technology in the future for the, their computational problem. So, um, is there are there any questions here? Uh, no, I don't think there are questions. You can carry on. I'll I'll take two if there are any. Questions. Okay, okay, awesome. Thank you. With this uh, with this teams, I don't even know. I, can you still see my screen? Sorry. Can you still see my screen? Yeah, yeah, I can see your screen. Yeah, please go. Ahead. Okay, great, great. So, um, uh, let me give you an overview of what computing with ions is like. Um, so, uh, we, uh. Uh, so uh, let me see if this uh, thing will play. C can you see it playing? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not playing from the beginning though. I don't know why. <laughs> huh, okay, it's not playing from the beginning, but whatever. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so... Um, so uh, chapter ions are basically um, uh, uh, so so, so um, uh, they're, they're laser cooled ions that are trapped in place by uh, by an uh, by an electromagnetic potential that's created by the lasers, right? Um, and so um, it, it, for uh, some of you may be familiar with this quantum circuit notation. A quantum algorithm looks uh, it currently the the paradigm with which quantum computers are programmed. They're called quantum circuits, and an example of that is shown in the top right over here. So on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis are the different qubits, right? So um, uh, at time t equal to zero, let's say all the qubits are initialized in the zero state, and then as time passes, uh, uh, the gates are executed. Uh, and uh, the execution of the gate here means that um, uh, the ex so each gate here is shown by one of these blocks um, and the execution corresponds to laser beams acting on the ions uh, that are indicated uh, in the diagram on the right over here, right? Um, and so as time passes, all the gates are executed and in the end, uh, there is a laser readout and um, the, uh, the 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 state of the qubits is collapsed into what's called a computational basis state. So either a zero or one for each qubit, right? Um, and um, in our system, um, the lasers can hit any individual atom or all of them at once. So it's extremely reconfigurable, and you can also have very high connectivity that is not really possible in uh, the other hardware approaches. And also, uh, uh, the quantum computers in our company can, uh, we have the vision that they can be networked using, photo they will be able to be networked using photonic interconnects, allowing for uh, scaling in a very modular fashion. Um, and um, uh, and, and uh, sort of, uh, as far as I know, this is the only reasonable uh, this is the only reasonable architecture I've seen, which actually has a path to scaling to many, uh, to many, many qubit systems. Uh, Sonica, we have a question. Go for it. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, so this is Simon Raj. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the video, we see that for each gate operation, you are actually shooting the atom or the ion with lasers, right? Mm -hmm. So each laser beam hits an individual ion. So how do you do the entangling operations, for example, the C naught or something? So are your laser beams like sort of have entangled photons or something? Right. So so what the laser beam? So I'm not a experimentalist, so I, I can only give you a very high level, uh, you know, understanding. But uh, basically, what the laser beams do is they they excite a particular um, motional mode of the ion, right? And um, if if two if two uh, ions are excited into the same mode, then they can couple, 
Right, and uh, and it's not just that, right? It's also because um, uh, the entanglement is also because so these are ions, right? So they have um, Coulomb interaction, right? So they can um, actually the Coulomb interaction is long range, right? So it can entangle any two ions, even if they're far away from each other. Um, and then you know it's turned on and off by the exciting of the mode. Okay, thank you. Yeah. OK, and so um, I was discussing earlier with the people on the call about, you know, uh, why atoms or ions versus other kinds of qubits, right? And uh, basically the uh, the one big uh, the one big uh, thing in favor of uh, one of the big, few th things in favor of this are listed in this uh, on this slide. So first of all, atoms are nature's qubit, right? So each atom is given by nature to be exactly the same as every other atom, right? Um, and so this actually, if you think about um, uh, you want to manufacture a quantum computer with thousands or even millions of qubits, that's an extremely, uh, extremely big advantage that the, that all atoms or ions are identical to each other. So, um, you know, I used to before I worked at INQ, I was working at um, Intel, right? And they were doing these solid state qubits. They were doing uh, superconducting qubits and uh, silicon quantum dot qubits. And uh, fabricating qubits that look like each other is a huge challenge. And if you if they are not, if they don't look like each other, it takes forever to tune them. It takes, you know, so you have to scan basically your microwave fre frequencies till you can find something that makes the qubit act like a qubit. And then uh, basically, you know, um, your re when you're coupling qubits over there, you have to manufacture resonators and, you know, they if, if there's any difference in, you know, the frequency of the resonator and the frequency of the qubit, that again gives you a problem. So um, all of those things are not there with atoms. They're all given by uh, nature to be exactly the same as each other. Um, and then again, uh, uh, they're perf they can be isolated very cleanly, right? Um, so th this is again a huge advantage because um, so if you remember, uh, so many of you might know that, um, uh, you know, atomic clocks are actually the standard of time. And basically the qubits that we are using here are the same. It's the same technology as the ones that make uh, as the one in the atomic clock, right? So it's extremely stable. It can be extremely isolated from the environment, right? It can uh, it, it can truly act as a quantum memory. It can be stable for large for long periods of time. Other, you know, compared to let's say superconducting qubits, which have um, lifetimes in microseconds. The lifetimes here, I think, the longest has been measured to be actually in hours. And then also, um, actually, uh, it's counterintuitive, but uh, it, there. Uh, no novel fabrication techniques are required, right? So the commercial silicon fab works great for just manufacturing the trapped iron, uh, the iron trap, sorry, right? Um, and so, so all of that makes it uh, extremely, um, extremely favorable for uh, commercializing this, uh, for this to be a platform that can be easily commercialized. Um, then uh, there are plenty of architectural benefits as well. Right, so currently the uh, systems that Sonica, we have a question. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think uh, the slide came immediately uh, when I raised my hand. Is the architectural question? Is the architecture dimensionally um, tunable? That means, can you go for three-dimensional architecture for the atoms, or it is primarily one and two? Right. So um, uh, currently, uh, the the uh, currently the systems we have uh, just have the atoms in a one D chain, right? Uh, and then uh, eventually we are going to move to having multiple chains on a single trap, right? But but still it's going to be pretty linear. But the good part is that uh, when we think of scaling up to hundreds of qubits, right? Um, in that in then it's no longer going to be linear because then uh, you're going to connect different ion traps with photonic interconnects, right? So then you can, uh, let's say you can have uh, this rack mounted kind of system where you can have these uh, ion, ion chains sort of stacked on top of each other and, and each like module is connected by a photonic interconnect. So that's how you can add in the dimensionality. And then um, I also want to add that even though it's one dimension, right? The the ions are in one dimension. You can still have all to all connectivity, which means that you can have entangling gates between any pair of qubits. 
right? So unlike in uh, in like um, you know solid state architectures like superconducting qubits, you can typically only if you want to entangle two qubits, you have to have a resonator between them, right? And so you can only have like 1D or 2D connectivity. Right here, even though it's 1D, actually from the user's point of view, it's all to all connectivity. Right, right. Thanks. Right. Um, and um, uh, this is a little bit of the pitch, uh, right? Uh, so if you go in and uh, want to use our systems over the cloud, um uh it's it's i i think it's uh you know it's fairly easy now um you can uh, write your quantum circuit uh, at a fairly high level you don't need to know very much actually you don't need to you need to know almost nothing about trapped iron quantum technology right if you read there's this book uh, textbook on nielsen and chuang so if you just read that you can you can start programming your first quantum programs um, and we will co compile and optimize the high level quantum logic gates for you. Um, and our systems are on the cloud 24-7 um, uh, and they're always being continuously calibrated. And uh, you don't need to calibrate your programs yourself, etc. So um, basically uh, kind of what this slide is trying to tell you is that it's well on its way to being an actual technology, right? So it's no longer a physics experiment. It's really like a computing system. It's not perfect yet. There's of course a lot of error, et cetera, but, uh, but it's no, I, I can say that it's no longer um, an experiment. It, it, it's a computer, right? And then um, uh, Akshay also asked me to uh, speak a little bit about our roadmap, right? So again, our roadmap is just kind of a projection of where we expect to be in the coming years, right? To uh, sort of give the community a sense of how we see the future in unfolding. Um, so, uh, uh, so currently we are in 2021 and our current, um, our current system is uh, uh, expected to have uh, 22 algorithmic qubits. Now, uh, what are algorithmic qubits? It's, um, uh, so uh, for those of you who, uh, uh, are like sort of following the quantum industry. Uh, IBM came up with a metric uh, called the quantum volume, right? And so the quantum volume is roughly speaking. Um, so um, if you have n qubits and you can run a depth n circuit, then your quantum volume is two to the power of n. So instead, um, and then this two to the power of n kind of that number kind of becomes meaningless, right? Like if you go to like thousand, uh, qubits and two to the power one zero two four, you can't actually write down that number. It's kind of meaningless. So algorithmic qubits is just the log of that uh, quantum volume effectively. Um, and um, so uh, roughly you can define it as the uh, um, effective number of qubits for a typical algorithm. Um, and um, this uh, in our current system, the number of algorithmic qubits is expected to be 22. And you can see how it's going to co increase uh, consistently every year. And so note that this is the number of algorithmic qubits, not necessarily the number of physical qubits, right? So if you have a shorter depth quantum algorithm, then uh, typically you could use uh, more than the number of algorithmic qubits. And um, around 2025, uh, you can see the, this, uh, these two stars. And that's when we expect error correction to kick in, right? Um, and so um, again, uh, with trapped ion systems, it's a it, the one of the huge advantages is that um, the error correction is all in software, so nothing needs to be hard coded. So if you think about superconducting qubits or any other like fabricated kind of qubit technology. Um, uh, the error correction really needs to be uh, done, uh, needs to be, you, you really need to plan for the error correction at the time of fabricating the chip, right? So for surface code, you have a particular layout of the of the qubits and for other codes, you may have other layouts, but uh, but in trapped ions, it, it's so reconfigurable that all the all the error correction is just basically software, right? That's programming when the laser gates are applied and so on and so forth, right? Since you have this all to all connectivity. Um, and so uh, what, uh, how we envision it is that around 2025, uh, we are going to slowly, uh, we are going to turn on error correction, right? And um, once we turn on error correction, you can really see that um, the slope of this curve is going to change and the number of qubits is going to advance at a much, uh, the number of algorithmic qubits is going to advance at a much um, faster pace. 
and um, uh, and really like um, when you're at around uh, you know at the right end of this graph, um, this number again it becomes a little bit misleading because um, at this point you're not uh, limited by the uh, you know, uh, you, you can basically, uh, the fidelity is so high that you can, uh, uh, you can use a lot more qubits uh, with, let's say, shorter depth algorithms, but, uh, you know, a lot more qubits should be suitable for uh, several applications. Um, Sonika, I have a question. Go for so, it. Um, so I'm very intrigued by this graph and how you, uh, uh, like, so I've seen this graph before, but, what are the different technological advances that need to be done to actually uh, follow this graph? And the second question I had was, can you give us an idea of, let's say, in 2025, you have 64 algorithmic qubits. What does it translate into like physical qubits uh, that you need to have? Right. So, um, uh, uh, so up till 2024, um, uh, this is just physical qubits, right? The number, there's no error correction being applied. So in 2025, there is a 16 to 1 error correction encoding predicted. So the number of physical qubits would be 64 times 16, right? And then uh, 256 times 16 and so forth. And then when you are at 384, then you're employing a 32 is to 1 error correction encoding. So you can multiply 384 by 32 to get uh, the num roughly the number of physical qubits. So that's uh, that's one thing. And then you were asking about uh, the different technological advances. Um, so I can list a few of them. I'm not really the hardware person, but uh, so a few of them are getting uh, so what are getting, for instance, um, photonic interconnects working at high speed and high fidelity, right? So um, the technology has been prototyped. Uh, there is um, there's sort of a clear path for. Uh, for how it's going to, um, you know, how it's going to be uh, productized, but still, you know, it has to be done, right? Uh, you're an experimentalist, so you know, right, that uh, uh, sometimes things take longer than expected and so on and so forth, right? Um, so photonic interconnects is uh, one of the technologies that needs to be um, um, sort of uh, uh, demonstrated at scale. Then, um, uh, let's see, um, I think, um, making all of the optics on chip, right? So currently it, it is a box, right? Um, and there's a lot of uh, work that's going into miniaturizing the optics and having it all of, all of that be on chip, right? Um, and then um, I think, uh, let's see. Um, I think there is uh, also a lot of work to be done in error correction, right? So um, there is a paper actually which shows the 16 is to 1 uh, error correcting, right? Um, there is an experimental paper out. Uh, uh, hello? Sonica, you are, you're dropping off a little bit. Um, I think Rahul has a question. Yeah, can you share your screen again? I think you dropped off. Okay, can you hear me now? I can ask my question quickly. Yeah. I don't actually work on quantum computing, but in the field where I work, people keep on writing papers saying here is a quantum algorithm for solving nonlinear ordinary differential equations or even partial differential equations. Have any such applications been tried on the computer that you have at IonQ? Um, so small versions of them, right? Um, so so currently the systems that are on the cloud are only 11 qubits um, and all manner of uh, quantum algorithms have been tried on them. Right, um, I don't know if specifically a, a, a partial differential equation algorithm has been tried, um, but um, uh, yeah, a wide variety of things have been tried, right? And I'll describe some of them in my talk. Thank you. Yeah. So Akshay, were you happy with my answer to your question? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Akka. Thanks. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. So in uh, in this talk, uh, I'll be discussing applications of uh, ion trap quantum computers in um, quantum machine learning. Um, uh, so I'll be describing uh, do how you would go about doing a nearest central classification. Uh, using the INQ quantum computer, and I also, um, uh, if I have time, I may not have time, 
but uh, I also discuss uh, how we can use uh, trapped ion quantum computers to study uh, condensed matter systems, uh, uh, study different kinds of condensed matter systems and different uh, kind of uh, ask different questions such as uh, what are the dynamics of a particular correlated system, etc. Um, how much time do I, am I halfway through? Yeah, yeah, you're halfway through. Yes. Okay. So um, uh, let me let's go to the first application, which is near centroid classification on a quantum computer. Um, and so this falls under the category of quantum machine learning. Now in quantum machine learning, there is a lot of hype, right? Um, um, and since uh, machine learning by itself, even classical machine learning, it has such a wide range of applications and it's actually getting incorporated into almost all of the technology that we have today. So it's naturally a very attractive area for quantum computers as well. Uh, so the potential for uh, you know speed up or better learning, better quality of learning, um, uh, creates the hype. Um, and then uh, the caveat is that um, the algorithms that we know that have provable speed up, uh, uh, that have provable quantum speed up, um, uh, are known to only work on, uh, on fault tolerant machines that will only be practical in the long term. So probably you need thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands of qubits in order to have um, algorithms with provable speed up. Now, um, there are several proposals for uh, near-term algorithms which involve uh, variational circuits, uh, but like in much of machine learning, these algorithms uh, rarely have proof, right? Um, they, they don't, there's not much um, theoretical backing. And also, since we don't have large enough quantum computers, those uh, these um, variational algorithms cannot be tested at scale yet, right? And so that's a problem. Um, and in this work, what we did was we brought quantum machine learning a little bit closer to reality by demonstrating actual classification on a quantum system. So um, uh, what do we mean by classification? Um, so um, all of you, uh, I, I, I guess most of you must be familiar with, uh, like if you upload photos on Facebook, Facebook can, uh, can recognize your face and uh, assign can recognize people's faces and as assign a name to them. And uh, for instance, um, uh, classification can be something like differentiating between cats and dogs, right? Um, it can, there's also a lot of serious applications such as, uh, um, uh, let's say detecting uh, tumors, uh, brain tumors and MRI images um, in the medical field. So um, uh, classification basically it's it's go, it's pretty uh, it's pretty ubiquitous in today's technology. Um, in this work, what we did was uh, we uh, showed uh, classification on a quantum computer for two real life data sets. So one was this iris data set, which consisted of um, uh, consisted of uh, three species of uh, this iris flower, and the second data set was the MNIST data set which consisted of uh, different images of handwritten digits. So um, I'll be talking about how we did that, yeah, did that in the coming slides. So um, the first thing uh, when you want uh, to do a learning task is of course to pick an algorithm. And so here we picked an extremely simple algorithm called the nearest centroid classifier. Um, so in the nearest centroid classifier, uh, the model fitting step just involves finding the centroids of each class of training data. So let's say if you had uh, three classes as specified by the blue, green and red, uh, red uh, dots here, um, the centroid can be just calculated by getting the, uh, by getting the spatial average of all the points uh, in each class. And then when you're given a new data point and you want to predict the label of that new data point, you just compute the distance to each of the centroids. Um, and then uh, you assign that uh, point to the class uh, which has the shortest distance, right? And so what we did in this in this uh, work was we computed the distance to the uh, centroids sorry, on the quantum uh, sorry. computer. Sorry, Sonika, are you uh, on the in this talk slide or are you on some other slide? I am on this slide. Uh, in this talk, is that the title of the slide? No, no, no. 
Okay, can you switch slides? I think you're not. Uh, uh, the slides oh, are not switching. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> it's oh, stuck no. on in this talk. That uh, slide, I think. Can somebody confirm? Okay, can you just try sharing? Yeah, again? yeah, yeah. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay, so sorry for that. No, no, that's fine. I mean, as a hardware. Okay. Yeah. Okay, can you can you see it now? Uh, yeah, they can. Okay. That's the yes. slide. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, the earlier when I was talking about cats and dogs and MRI images, right? So so uh, th that's kind of uh, 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 not something big to miss. But uh, the one important thing that I did mention was that in this in this work we'll be doing classification on two real life data sets. One is the iris data set. Right, and one is this data set of handwritten uh, digits, images of handwritten digits, right? And then uh, now the next I was talking about this nearest centroid classification, where um, the first thing to do is you fit the model by finding the centroids of each class of training data. Um, so the example is given on the right here. So if you have uh, these blue, green, and red classes, um, uh, the model fitting step involves finding the centroids. And then if you're given a new data point and you want to assign a class to it, you compute the distance to each centroid and you assign the, the class that is assigned corresponds to the shortest distance. Um, and uh, what we did in this work was we calculated the distance to each of the centroids on the quantum computer. So we made it a quantum near centroid classifier. Does that make sense? Any questions? Sorry that uh, I was talking without changing the slide. Okay, okay, so I have a question. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, hi. So my question is, did this, uh, yeah, so did this uh, like actually show any advantage over the classical, like classification algorithms? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, for, uh, so it was so the, the way the experiment was designed, right? Um, uh, so it was what we were doing was just computing the distance to the centroids quantumly, right? So in yeah. terms of how accurate it was, um, uh, it actually I'll show you in the coming slides. It actually matched the performance of the classical computer, right? So um, uh, and that's how it was designed, right? The best possible it could do was actually uh, match uh, match the accuracy of the classical. Um, uh, of the classical classification, but uh, more importantly, um, this this near central classification, it can be uh, a building block of uh, more complicated algorithms like k-means, uh, you know, and other, you know, uh, sort of other um, other more complicated machine learning algorithms. And when you, if you were using this in that in that context, then you would have you would get like a speed up in time. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So the advantage in this case would be in time, uh, not in accuracy. Yeah, for this later on, right? Later on. So not now. Like for now, it's only a demonstration that we have replicated the outcome of a classical algorithm. Right, right. Because because yeah. it's only eleven qubits, right? So it, yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but still, right. yeah. So um, um, yeah. Let's go to the further slides, and I'll show you the data. Right. OK, um, and so um, uh, so I mentioned that we are going to be computing the distance to the centroids in, on the quantum computer. And so how to do this? Um, so we uh, so we uh, in collaboration. So this project was done uh, with uh, in collaboration with a quantum software company called QC, QCWare. Right. And they designed these circuits, which basically if you are given two data points X and Y, uh, you can use the circuit to find uh, to find uh, basically the dot product between the ve vectors X and Y. And so the circuit consists of two parts. The first part is uh, 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 loading the data point X and the second part is uh, the adjoint of that, right? Um, so you do the inverse, so basically do the circuit in reverse. So the first half of the circuit corresponds to X and the second half corresponds to Y. And so this BS here, right? So these these gates, it's called a BS gate. Um, they are they're actually uh, they're actually parameterized gates and the parameters call uh, can be calculated from uh, the elements of the vectors X uh, vector X and then in the second half from the vector Y, right? Um, 
And uh, basically, um, these circuits are shallow and uh, noise and robust to noise. And I'll, I'll I'll show you what that means later on. Um, and so so that's 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 a pretty important thing for something you want to test on a near term quantum computer. So the the depth of the circuit only scales as log of the uh, log of the number of elements in uh, in the data point X or Y. Um, and uh, there's some uh, more detailed things where you can also combine them with like a, a technique called amplitude estimation to actually get more of a speed up over classical computers. We didn't do that in this case, but it can be done. OK, so um, uh, next, uh, so once we have uh, the circuits and the algorithm in place, we decided to run it on our systems. Right, so we tested it uh, on our 11 qubit trapped ion quantum computer. The gates used were single qubit rotations and maximally entangling molmer sorensen gates. Um, so so if, you, if, if you don't know, um, these are just uh, the native gates on trapped ion quantum computers. <clears throat> and then um, the average fidelity of the two qubit gates available over the cloud is uh, more than 96%. Uh, we tested four and eight qubit versions of the circuit, which each had um, 12 and 32 qubit gates respectively. So the reason I list this, these numbers is because um, the two qubit gates are um, are the most uh, are, are the noisiest part of the circuit. So uh, basically the accuracy of the algorithm is determined by um, the number of two qubit gates. Uh, Sonika, we have a question from Apurva. Go for it. Yeah. I just want to know some simple definitions. What is the definition of your distance? It is just the dot product of the two octaves. Um, so it would be um, so so x x and y would be um, a modulus x square plus modulus y square minus two x dot y, right? So here we are calculating yeah. the x dot y. Okay, so it's not the Hamming distance. No, no, not the Hamming distance. It's the dot product, it's like the cost. Mm -hmm. OK, and uh, well, the way you calculate it, it is just like a parallel computer kind of calculation, or are there any other tricks used? Um, uh, sorry, what do you mean by parallel computer kind of calculation? Well, it, just as it is done on a classical computer, you would uh, when you calculate a dot product, you calculate the product of each component one by one and then add them together. No, so this is completely different, right? So basically um, you're loading the so um, so when you have so X is let's say a vector, right? Um, so you're loading the vector X into the quantum computer and loading the vector Y and you're and basically calculating the overlap between the wave functions X and Y. Does that make sense? So, OK, so how do you calculate the overlap? It's uh, some kind of measurement process. Yes, exactly. So so you have the circuit over here, right? So um, the first half of the can you see my mouse actually? Yeah, I can see the circuit, but I am not familiar with the notation with this S and B and whatever. The so basically first half of the circuit, uh, we are loading um, X, right? Um, so uh, the vector let is there any way I can um, annotate this? I don't know. Uh, let's see. I'm not so used to Teams, but. No, but that's that's just on your Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, right? On PowerPoint, you can use a. I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you go to yeah. Okay. So um. One second. I have. Well, I'll just try to draw with my mouse. I typically have like a pen that I can draw with. But um, basically, the first half of the circuit, uh, you're loading. Okay, I. You know what? I'm just going to actually do it with. So 
the first half of the circuit is loading this, right? And uh, the second half of the circuit is uh, doing loading the, you know, loading this. Doing something like that. And then uh, when you measure the first qubit, uh, you can get, uh, you can get this. Does that make sense? Okay, but for that you have to measure one qubit in the basis specified by the other qubit. Exactly, right? So if you want to, uh, let's say you you have this observable, or you want to get this, uh, let's say this number, uh, you know, this overlap, and that you base. I'll describe it in the later slides, but basically you get that from measuring this uh, q zero, right? So the top qubit, um, you know, th that that is given to you by the measurement of the top qubit. Diagram uh, and the answer to be so you have to perform many such measurements to get a exactly that you're interested in exactly exactly so each time you measure you just get a one or a zero but when you average over them then it will converge to this number okay right so um here here as you know is describing a little bit more so uh, basically uh, we are using a unary encoding here where the number of qubits is equal to the dimension of the data point right so it's a it's the least efficient encoding you can use in terms of the number of qubits but it leads to the shortest circuits and if you actually want to save on the number of qubits you can use more dense encodings but then you have to use um higher depth circuits so basically more gates and your answer will be um less accurate uh, so in this case, we just did the simplest possible thing. Um, the output state on the so with this encoding, um, you know, the output state on the ideal quantum computer would produce a, a state of this form, right? So in this state, uh, only one of the qubits is going to be measured. Ideally, only one of the qubits would be measured in the one state. Everything, all the other qubits would be in the zero state, right? And so the algorithm requires estimation of A1 square. Right, so which I mentioned before. So if you want to get the dot product, you require, you just need to measure a one, the the probability of getting the first qubit in the one state. But what happens is since the uh, since the uh, since there is noise in the gates, right? The quantum computer is not uh, fault tolerant yet. The output uh, will have finite probability outside of this unary encoding subspace as well. And so. Um, uh, what will happen is that um, when you uh, when you uh, when you run the circuit and you measure all the qubits in the n, ideally uh, what you would get would be uh, something uh, uh, would be similar to what you see on the right here. That only uh, only the uh, only very few uh, states that correspond to those in the unary encoding would have non-zero probabilities. But what uh, you actually get from the quantum computer is the stuff on the left here. So you see a lot of non-zero probabilities, but this actually gives you an error mitigation op opportunity, right? So um, uh, instead of just calculating A1 squared directly, what you can do is you can post process this histogram to discard states that you know are erroneous and calculate A1 after renormalizing the, re re the remaining probability distribution. And so you'll see that this actually um, uh, is quite advantageous and leads to very, um, uh, very high, uh, high uh, accuracy answers. Um, so the uh, first thing we did was we just generated some synthetic data for, uh, for uh, synthetic data in four and eight dimensions. Um, and uh, looked at the uh, the the how the quantum computer performed in classifying this. Um, so here on the here I'm showing the uh, the results from four different experiments. Uh, so NQ is the number of qubits, so four qubits and eight qubits. Um, NC is the uh, number of classes, right? So this uh, this. Uh, uh, this uh, experiment had two classes, this had four and so on. And NS is the number of shots. Uh, so we were just discussing this, right? So uh, you can't measure just once. You have to measure uh, many times to get statistics. So this is the number of classes. 
and uh, actually uh, this orange, so it's not, I don't know why the color is not showing up correctly, but the orange bar over here is the result after post processing and the blue bars are the result before post processing. And you can see that um, when you are at four qubits, right, and two classes, you have no errors, even if uh, you don't apply any post processing or anything, you have no errors. Right, and um, when you go to eight qubits and two classes, you have no errors after you apply post processing. And then eight qubits and four classes, uh, after you apply post processing, you have a 90% uh, accuracy for the quantum computer. Right. Um, then uh, let's look at the performance for a real life data set. So this data set um, has um, uh, each data point has four dimensions. It's called the iris data set. So each, um, so so uh, the dimensions correspond to the length and width of the petals and sepals of the iris flower. And um, this data set is not so easy to classify uh, by the nearest centroid algorithm. So therefore it's, it's actually uh, used as a benchmark for even classical classification algorithms. And um, classically um, the, uh, the accuracy of uh, of the classification is about 93%, right? And you can see that uh, uh, on our quantum computer, the classification accuracy does not, it, it's not um, uh, as good as the classical one, but you can see how much benefit the post-processing had that the error came down quite a bit, right? And uh, on the right here, you can see the benefit of designing that error mitigation technique. Right, so before mitigation, there were some points that were sort of midway between uh, the two classes, and after after error mitigation, those points can be classified correctly. So, any questions over here? So, if no questions, I'll proceed. So, so the next uh, data set that we tried was uh, the it's called the MNIST data dataset. So, it consists of these images of handwritten digits. So actually in this data set, each image has 784 points, right? A 784 dimensions. So obviously uh, we could not run that on our eight qubit system. So, uh, oh sorry, 11 qubit system. So we actually did a dimensional reduction. And uh, 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 so we use the principal component analysis technique. So to bring it down from 784 uh, dimensions to eight dimensions, and then we ran the quantum algorithm on it. And so we, we created different subsets of the MNIST data set. So for example, consisting of just the digits zero and one or two or seven, and we even did it on all 10 digits. And you can, and so the diamonds over here, they are denoting the uh, accuracy of the classical classifier. And you can see that the quantum classifier is actually matching the accuracy of the classical classifier in every single instance. And this is actually really remarkable. So we have not used any kind of error correction here, right? The, the fidelity of the gates is only 0.96, right? And we're using 32 two qubit gates. And still we find that um, actually the technique is quite, actually like the performance is quite robust. Um, it is quite, uh, performance of the algorithm is quite robust um, to the noise. And over here, I just want to also flash uh, what's called the confusion matrices, right? So um, it, it, it actually it just gives you a sense of uh, it gives you a more detailed look into how the how the classifier did. So on the left here is the classical, and on the right here is the quantum. And if you look at the diagonal, it tells you how accurate the classification was for each um, each. Uh, each different class, right? And you can see that the classical and the quantum are matching quite well. Um, so I think you have about five minutes. Okay, so I, I will just uh, actually not go to the condensed matter stuff. I'll just end on the machine learning stuff. Um, and um, uh, this is actually my second last slide on the machine learning, so that's good. Um, and then, um, uh, so, um, you know, the reason we were able to do so well at the classification was um, uh, because of the uh, was partly due to the error mitigation technique. So a lot of like when you look at quantum uh, computing, quantum computing papers, you know, they'll put in some error mitigation, but they will rarely analyze 
how the error mitigation scales to larger system sizes. So we went in and actually did the analysis and we found that uh, there are basically two kinds of errors in our in our uh, that affect the accuracy of the algorithm. One is an error that would redistribute the weight within the ideal density matrix, right? But um, we found that this error is actually uh, expected to grow quite slowly, right? Um, and only logarithmically as the dimension of the problem grows. And the second is uh, would be a depolarizing error, which uh, basically redistributes the weight from the ideal density matrix to a completely mixed state. And this error is, is taken care of by our error mitigation technique, where we were post-processing the histogram to discard uh, the invalid states. And uh, what we found was that the post selection actually gets more effective at removing this error as the number of dimensions increases, provided that you're over some fidelity threshold, which is quite uh, easy to do actually for iron traps. Um, and so this, this is just the conclusions of the uh, of uh, the near centroid, uh, uh, the, uh, the quantum near centroid uh, classification. Um, so we successfully used it to classify real world data sets with up to 10 classes. Um, and a key design choice was using a sparse encoding technique, which allowed for effective error mitigation opportunities. Right, and the, here the paper is over here. So I also had a bunch of condensed matter applications, but I won't go into that since we're at the end. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. sorry that it would have been nice to have a very short, short glimpse of the condensed matter stuff as well. <laughs> I'm biased because that's what I do. Yeah, OK, so I, I can uh, go over it uh, very like I'll give you just a quick overview. Right. So um, uh, and you can always go in and look at the papers, right? So um, uh, one of the experiments I was going to describe was looking at uh, the dynamics of a many body localized system on a quantum computer, right? Um, and um, uh, so what we did here was measure the spectral functions of. So we designed a circuit to study the dynamics. From the dynamics, we extracted spectral functions and uh, we measured the spectral functions in both the delocalized phase near the phase transition and in the localized phase. And we found again, we designed some uh, noise mitigation techniques that allowed us to recover the spectral functions exactly uh, in uh, with almost no error in all three phases. So over here, the solid line was the theoretical prediction and the the points are the experimental experimentally measured uh, numbers. And so we were able to uh, do that. And then um, another thing that I was going to describe was uh, simulating a Fermi Hubbard model on a trapped ion quantum computer. So um, over here, um, we again, um, used uh, adiabatic evolution to prepare uh, uh, prepare the the ground state of the uh, uh, Fermi Hubbard model at uh, at finite value of the interaction and then we extracted what's called the Rennie entropy uh, from that um, and um, and basically again uh, uh, basically, again, we did this thing where we designed an error mitigation technique, which allowed us to um, uh, uh, exactly re recover the Rennie entropy um, without having any error correction. So again, uh, you know, the theoretical curve and the data uh, matched. So I guess the theme over here is that even when you have noisy quantum computers, Right. If you go in and do an analysis often of how the noise in the system is affecting your algorithm and you build a model around that, um, um, you can uh, you can uh, recover a lot of the useful information and get and vastly improve the accuracy of your algorithm. Was that too quick? I guess that was too quick, but. That's, thanks, thanks, Seneca. Yeah. Uh, I would have loved to talk about it more, but. OK, uh, so let's uh, thank Sonika again for the wonderful talk. Um, and uh, if people want to unmute and clap, I think that's fine. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, and then um, uh, if if anybody has a follow up question, I think Sonika can hang around for a bit. Yeah. So uh, Sumanan has a question. Sumanan, please go ahead. Uh, hi, 
So actually, uh, this theoretical calculation that you mentioned for the Fermi Hubbard model is the DMRG calculation. Or like, no. Ah, uh, no, that was just a, a ED exact diagonalization okay. because it was a very small system, so just two mm -hmm. sides, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have a question on the probabilistic nature of the algorithm in the sense that you have to run the algorithm for many shots to get some uh, desired accuracy. Right. Now, uh, dependence of the accuracy on the number of shots is only power law. And uh, that is not the kind of logarithmic scaling which you want um, in terms of the output uh, precision. It's a uh, it behaves like a 1 over epsilon or 1 over epsilon square, but not a log epsilon. Right. Just like you look at the complexity in terms of the number of input bits, you should also consider the complexity as the number of output bits. And uh, that is a problem with all these measurement uh, based algorithms which rely on central limit theorem or something like that for convergence. But there are techniques to go beyond that. Have you explored any one of them? Right, so one of the, um, so two things, right? So one of the techniques is um, basically, um, uh, you know, instead of converging as one over epsilon square, you can converge. So if epsilon is the required precision, instead of converging as one over epsilon square, you can converge as one over epsilon. And it's called an amplitude estimation uh, technique. And uh, we actually, actually we are in the process of exploring, the, of implementing techniques like that and getting that additional speed up as well. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is e even with that technique, right? Like even if you go from one over epsilon square to one over epsilon, it's still, you still need to repeat many times, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, the speed up is coming uh, in, so far in, in this, um, so, so in, the, in the examples that I was discussing, the speed up is coming in N, right? So often instead of doing something uh, that scales as two to the power of n, you can do something that scales polynomially in n, where n is the number of particles of the, in the system or the dimension of the problem, whatever, right? Um, so um, if you go to large enough n, then, um, then you know, th even though you need to repeat, uh, repeat uh, many times to get the precision down, uh, it's still an advantage. Okay. Okay, are there other questions? Sonika? Okay. Uh, I guess not. So, uh, shall we end this meeting then? Well, we should thank uh, Sonika for a wonderful talk. Um, yeah. This was our third or fourth, I think, talk of the IQTI series. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. I hope to meet you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.